So I have a clear and distinct memory of falling asleep one night the day after I learned when the results we're going to talk about today and just thinking it's the most wonderful thing. You know, like, I remember laying in bed just being like, wow, that is really incredible. And like, how is that even true? How is that even possible? But it is true. I see it's true. And that was a really nice feeling. So I want to share that with you. So today we want to talk about local moves. And what I mean by a local move is we're going to talk about how modifying a knot or a link locally in one small way, how that impacts the knot or the link. So let me give you the, the simplest example of a local move. This would be our first local move that we consider. So when you see, when you see on your knot or your link some crossing, a local move we're going to do is we're going to switch it with the opposite crossing. So if it's an undercrossing, it becomes an overcrossing. If it's an overcrossing, it becomes an undercrossing. And this local move is just called a crossing change. Then we'll say that um, two knots are related by a series of crossing changes if you can move from one knot to the other via just crossing changes. Okay, so, so what, thinking about crossing changes, uh, maybe uh, a good question is like, well, if you start out with some knot, what can you do to it if you allow it to change crossings? Okay, so like, what other knot do you think you can make? What kinds of restrictions might you have? It seems like you can like, untangle the knot and like, create a knot with less crossing. Oh, so here's a claim. Proposition. Any knot can be unknotted via just crossing changes. Okay, so so why how would you do that? I have some knot. Yeah, you just kind of like keep pulling it apart and just, just keep. Well, like what does a crossing change mean? Uh, one way to think about what a crossing change is letting you do is a crossing change essentially means, this means the knot can pass through itself. Right, that's what is really going on here. It was going under and you pass through itself. It phased through itself. So, so that's really what this crossing change is doing. And so intuitively, it makes sense that like, if any knot can pass through itself, then you can just unknot it. Right? You can, but, but let's make a proof of this. So here's the proof of how we can see this a little bit more rigorously. Um, begin with any old knot. So let me try and, oh, I don't know. Let me, let me pick some knot. So here's a, a nice knot. Okay, so here's some, here's some knot. This is, a, this is actually a connect sum of two trefoils. And you can kind of see that two trefoils have been fused together into a single knot. But here's how I'm going to play the game. I'm going to start at some point, and I'm going to trans traverse the knot. I'm going to travel around the knot. So. Start somewhere and traverse the knot following, following some orientation. And so when I get to a crossing, I'm going to impose the rule that I'm going to make sure it's an overcrossing. So as you travel, Systematically change crossings into overcrossings. Change crossings into overcrossings. 
So I'm going, this guy's already an overcrossing. Oh, this one was an undercrossing, but now I'm going to apply a local move of a crossing change there to change it from an undercrossing to an overcrossing. So then I keep traveling along the knot, keep traveling along the knot. This one's already an overcrossing, so I'm pretty happy. Oh, now I get somewhere, and well, I've already traveled over it, and it was an overcrossing, and so I don't want to change it back into an undercrossing, right? So I'm only going to change it into an overcrossing if you haven't been there already. So as you travel, change crossings into overcrossings unless you've already, you know, passed over it, passed through it. So this one I'll keep an undercrossing because I've already passed through it. This one I'll keep an undercrossing. This one I'll keep an undercrossing. But now that I get to a new crossing I haven't been to yet, I'm going to change it into an overcrossing. So I applied a local move to change that undercrossing to an overcrossing. I keep going. I can make, this is an overcrossing. That's good. Oh, this was an undercrossing, but I want to make it an overcrossing. And then I've already passed through so an undercrossing, I've already passed through that one's an undercrossing, and then back to where I started. And I claim now it's unknotted. Why, why is it unknotted? Yeah, that's true. And what we can see it is just like, it's, just, it's always lying on top of itself. You know, it's like it's always lying on top of itself. If you think about this in three-dimensional space, you started out high, and you would always go in lower, because you always crossed over itself. So, so it's always kept going you know, lower down in three-dimensional space, until you, know, you kept going lower and lower and lower, like lower z, z values in three-dimensional space, lower z values, until you, know, you kept going under itself so many times, until you got here, and then you came back up to the top and joined back with itself. But if you're always traveling down, there's no way it can get knotted. This is, I'm always traveling down, so there's no way I can knot it with anything. Happy? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine like if you have a piece of string and you just lay it down on a piece of table so it always crosses over itself, well then there's no way that can get knotted up. Does that look backwards, backwards as well? If you make um, overcrossings, undercrossings? Yeah, that's right. You could do the exact opposite and then it would be like the knot's always traveling upwards. So you make sure it's always going under itself and it always be traveling. So you, uh, this was an arbitrary choice. But it was just one way to see that we could accomplish this. Okay, so since any knot can be changed via crossing changes into the a nut, what are some natural questions you might start asking? How many changes? Oh, good. So, so a really natural question, so let's write that down, is given a knot, Well, maybe, you know, like, like here we did it. How many moves did it take us to change this one? Three. Uh, I think we did two, because I, I circled them red every time I made a change. So, oh, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. I, I did that one with, with three, right? Could, could I have done it with less than three? So here's the question. Given a knot, what is the minimal? number of crossing changes needed to turn it into the unknot. Well, and like, yeah. That's like the connect sum of two trap coils. Wouldn't it be like number of crossings for one trap coil? Oh, oh, that's really good. Okay, hold on to that thought for a second. Um, hold on to that. We'll come right back to that. So here, I'm going to call this, I'm going to uh, define this U of K, which is the uncrossing number of K. The minimum number of changes needed. And here, 
in this particular time, I used three. Could you accomplish this with fewer than three? Let me, let me draw this diagram afresh, and you can try and uh, decide how, which diagram was this. That was this guy. Can you, can you accomplish this with fewer than three crossings? Can we change this with fewer than three crossings? Okay, great. If you were just to switch the two top ones, then we would have this guy on the left, which you can or not, and this guy on the right, switching that one, you can lift that up and unknot it. And so we achieved it with just two. Do you think it's possible to achieve it with just one? You don't think so? I mean, I already warped the diagram. Could we do just one crossing change? You know, it's kind of a hard thing to calculate. Um, so we've shown so far that the uncrossing number for this particular knot, the uncrossing number for this particular knot is at most two, because we're done with two moves. Maybe, maybe it's maybe we can do it for one. Maybe not. You don't think you can. You know, it's like, it's like one of those things where it's like, what if there's a really clever way to do with one, you know? When there's only so many if crossings. You, yeah. If you do one, you'll add up the other one, but then the other one will be a trefoil, right? Yeah. And if you add well, an unlock, a trefoil, and then you need to go back yeah, to the user spot. Then. Okay, so, so, so you've checked um, all of the different crossings on this particular diagram. On um, this particular diagram. You've kind of checked all the ones. You're like, if I only did this one, that part's still knotted. If I only did that one, you know, you can check all the, all the um, crossings on this particular diagram. But you're assuming that, well, if I can unknot this knot, then I can unknot this diagram with just one move, mm. right? Maybe, maybe there's some other diagram for the knot mm -hmm. where you can see the uncrossing. So here's an important warning. Warning. The on crossing number is not preserved across diagrams. Not. <laughs> is not preserved across diagrams of the same knot. So let me make that more precise. There's a little result. Uh, let me cite who, this, who showed this. This was, hmm, I'm not sure who proved this. I, I'll try to link to it in the video description. But uh, for instance, it was shown that given any knot K, like the trefoil, a really simple knot, and any natural number N, like 500, there exists a diagram for K that requires at least n crossing changes to one knot. So let's make this clear. If I have the trefoil, the uncrossing number of the trefoil is what? How many crossings do you have to change to unknot it? Yeah, just one. You change any of the crossings. You, know, you pick your favorite one. If you change any one of them, you know, change this one, for instance. Well, now you can just unknot it, right? So, so change any one of the crossings. It's one. But, but, there is some diagram. for the trefoil 
That needs, yeah, whatever number you want. 500 crossing changes. Well, I said at least, at least 10. So, so, you know, you can pick any number. And you need at least that many. So that's quite surprising, right? Like, like it's, it's not enough to check one diagram. You have to check all diagrams, right? And see which one requires the fewest. So it's like not invariant? Well, it's an invariant of the not, but it's not invariant of the diagram, right? And so it's like, given the not, there is some number. And no matter how you change the not, that's still the number for the not. Because we're defined to be the minimum number needed to change that not. But as you change the diagrams, well, you can't just look at a diagram and you know, see. Because you know, some diagram maybe has you know, on crossing number 5, but you don't know that there's maybe some other diagram that doesn't have on crossing number 2 or 3 or something. So, so this is hard to calculate. So the moral of the story, u of k is hard to calculate. Now, yeah, so you had some really good intuition a moment ago. Um, we, when, we look, when looking at this knot, when looking at um, this knot, you said, well, that is just the connect sum. It's a combination of two trefoils, right? So, 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 connect sum of two trefoils. And so you might think, well, how does the uncrossing number of the connect sum of two knots relate to the uncrossing numbers of those knots? Well, certainly adding them immediately, we can prove immediately that gives you an upper bound. So why is this an, an upper bound? Why is it that you can on uh, you can on not? I'm sorry. Wow. Uh, <laughs> this <laughs> we need to make a huge edit. This is not called the on crossing number. <laughs> this is called oh maybe we can we can point over here. This is called the on knotting number. Wow. This is the on knotting number of the knot. So huge huge edit. But, but I think that's the only place I need to change it, right? Okay, the unknotty number is the number of crossings you need to change to unknot it. Okay, great. I'm glad I caught that now. Okay, so um, this, why is this clear? Well, to unknot, what's one way to unknot K connect some J? Yeah, you can just unknot k then j, right? So there's our proof. Done, <laughs> because the unknotting number of k connect some j is the minimum number of 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 um, crossing changes needed. And you know, well, one way you can unknot it is just to take the number of crossing changes needed to unknot k, and then look at the number of crossing changes needed to unknot j, and the, this number is always going to then be the minimum will be less than or equal to the sum of those. So that's clear. But I think what you wanted to say is something stronger than this. What, what were you suggesting before? That it's strictly equal. Yeah. So, so conjecture. That in fact, that's always the best way to on not k connect some j is just to on not k and then to on not j. There's no shortcut you can take that will on not the combination without on not them both. So the conjecture is the on notting number for k connect some j is the on notting number for k plus the on notting number for j. So who thinks this is true? Who thinks it's false? Well, Good news is we don't know. <laughs> this, this is an open conjecture. It's an old conjecture, but we've been unable to prove it. And so this kind of goes back to the moral that calculating these things is really hard. And so it's really hard for us to make any progress.
on these kinds of questions. It seems like a really fundamental thing. I mean, recall, this, is, this kind of echoes something similar. Uh, what, do you, what does this look um, like that's kind of familiar that we looked at before? Uh, determinant, and then that led to the discussion of looking at surfaces and the... The Zyphot surface, and then we looked at the, the what of the surface, the... The genus, that's right. So we have, we can show, and it wasn't hard for us to show that the genus of K connects some J is just the genus of K plus the genus of J. So we say the genus is additive under connect sum. And so you want to say something similar that the Anani number is additive, but we haven't been able to prove this. Uh, a lot of people have thought about this, but not even close to. Um, so, so open problem. If you do prove it, you can write it up, give it to me, I'll give you an A in the class, and then I'll publish it. Okay, so, um, so the first local move we talked about here is, is, is these crossing changes. Um, I, I'll just note that we can do the same story for links. So, um, so similarly, we can um, think about, we can define the uncrossing, uh, the unknotting un number for a link, which we call the unlinking number. So uh, u of l is the minimum number of crossing changes needed to um, to obtain the um, the unlink the trivial link so let's try some some quick examples um, how about I have uh, let's say this link so this is a link with two components how many crossings do you have to change in order to get down into the link with just two components that are on on knotted unlinked from each other one. yeah and which one did you change did you change this one no. no just one of these guys right if you just change one of those guys now these are no longer linked together and so you just have this guy going through him and then you can pull him out right so that's exactly right good well in general you might have some really complicated link right you might have some, some link, well, the one component may be, you know, knotted up in some way. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe like a trefoil or something. And then the other component may like link around it. And this component may also be um, knotted up in some way. You know, he may link around him in some way. It could be quite complicated, whatever it may be. So what's a general strategy you might use to try and Unlink these guys and obtain the trivial link. Mm -hmm. Put one on top and one on top for all the yeah, just, yeah. yeah, so so you might want to like first separate them from each other. So you might think, well, first I'm gonna separate these two from each other. So I'm gonna change this crossing right here to kind of free him from this guy and, and change this crossing. So then the orange one is freed from the uh, white piece. And then I'm going to do the necessary crossing change to uh, change this into a trivial component. So you might first, uh, you might try some strategy like this, like first split the links And then second, you might try something like unknotting the links, or unknot the components. That seems like a reasonable strategy. Um, and you might think that's the optimal way to unlink a link and get down to the trivial link. Uh, warning, this is not always optimal. That is, to calculate the unlinking number, it's not as easy as just thinking about, well, how many changes do I have to make to unlink the components, plus how many changes do I need to uh, unknot each component? 
It's not that easy. The two interact somehow. The linking interacts with the knotting in some sophisticated ways. And so in the process of unlinking, you might be introducing new knotting, or it's, this isn't always the, the quickest way to do it. And so I'll leave it to you to try and think of some examples. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of work here showing that you know, it's really hard in general to find the best strategy to, to calculate these numbers. So these things are hard to calculate, but I wanted to mention them because they're pretty well-studied objects. Okay, so, so we've introduced crossing change. Well, maybe we want to um, go back to this local move and tweak it a little bit. And so let's modify it slightly. Because when we allowed ourselves to just move through ourselves, then we like lost all information. You know, everything became trivial. And it was just a matter of counting how long did it take for it to become trivial, how many moves. But eventually everything became trivial. And so we're going to impose some kind of restriction. So let's introduce our second move. That, so here's our second move. This will be done on links. So given links, given some link, you can do this local move. You can change crossings, but only when both strands belong to the same component. So here's the restriction I'm introducing. Same component. Same component. So for instance, if I have something like this, this is called the Hopf link, I cannot, this is not equivalent to them being pulled apart because I can't pull them through each other. If, however, I have something like this link, this is called the whitehead link. If I have the whitehead link, what can I do? Yeah, I can still change one of these orange crossings, which is effectively pulling it through itself. And so it's still equivalent to this guy. And so that's the distinction. I require it to be the same component. So this local move is called link homotopy. Link homotopy. It was introduced by Milner in the 1950s. And link homotopy is the move where components of a link can pass through themselves, but not each other. What's the name of that link? Uh, this is called the whitehead link, and this is called the, the Hopf link. Um. Okay, so what are some observations you can immediately make about link homotopy? It's non-trivial. Uh, in the sense that there are some things that cannot be made into the trivial link. No. Yeah, that's right. Um, what things can be made into a trivial link? Uh, oh yeah, good. That's very good. Any knot. You know, a knot is just a one component link. So any knot is homotopic to the unknot. So for knots, it's still not very interesting. So sometimes then I'll just write like K to indicate something's been knotted up. So anything knotted up into a knot K is homotopic to the unknot. So, so any knot K is homotopic to the unknot. Good. But what are things that... The other link, like that one, uh, like the whitehead link, uh -huh. there's three of them, so they're not linked to each other, but the whole group. The Bromian ring? Yeah. Oh, so uh, that's a good question. Like, what's going on with the Bromian rings? Let's get there in a second. Yeah, we should think about that in a second. Um, 
Yeah, what kinds of things can become trivial links? What kind of information is preserved on link homotopy? You know, is there anything that like is, stays the same? Why can't this be made into the trivial link, but this one can? Any, any ideas? Oh, good. So give me a conjecture that involves linking number and link homotopy. Things that even linking number? Uh, what's the linking number of this guy? Because the one, if we orient it, because these are going in opposite directions, the linking number comes out to be what? Yeah, yeah one of these gives you a plus one, one gives you a minus one, so you end up here, your linking number between, if you call these components like component one and component two, it comes out to be zero. So uh, I guess that's in the same spirit of your uh, conjecture, a little bit stronger. Uh, here, my linking number between my components L1 and L2 is 1. And here for the trivial link, of course, it's also 0. They're not linked at all. So what kind of conjecture might you make? Yeah, so let's think what's going on here. I'm allowed to pass through itself, but components are not allowed to pass through each other. So it seems pretty clear that you won't be able to reduce linking number at all. So said another way, uh, if, if L is, so L is some link with some components, if L is link homotopic to L prime, that implies that the linking number between any two components of L, Li and Lj, should be the same as the linking number between Li prime and Lj prime. All right, so maybe this is components one and two and one and two, but I'm just allowing for more components in my link. Right, so you might begin with some, uh, so how might we see this, you know, like, you might begin with some, let's draw something like this. You might begin with something like this, or maybe I'll call this link component one, this large one, two, and this small meridional one, three. And then you go ahead and you deform it via link homotopy. And so what are some things you could do? Well, you could pull L2 through itself, and so that would then free it, so now L1 flies off, you know? So maybe your L1, you can, you can fly off, your L1 is over here, you still have L2, this big component, and L3 is still wrapped around it. And you could always deform L1 if you wanted to. You can knot it up in some way. Sure, you can, you can do all kinds of crazy things. So there's an example of two links that are link homotopic. These are link homotopic. And here's my L3. But my linking numbers all stay the same. Why is that? Well, how did we calculate linking number? Yep. Can you think of any of the definitions that would help us immediately see why this is true? What was the first definition? We just counted. We, this cal we calculated this. So we calculated linking number by counting crossings between two different components, and we gave them some sign based on orientations, right? So we just, we just counted these guys. And those aren't changing. Link homotopy is only changing it when you have the same component. But you don't change at all when you have the different components. 
So no matter what you do, these guys are not going to be changed by lincomatopy. So none of that is being changed by your lincomatopy, and so uh, your linking number has to stay the same. Is a linking number always only calculated between two components? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, like you can do like the linking number here, for instance, between L1 and L2 would be zero, but between like L3 and L2, so L2 and L3, well, depending on how you orient things, either be plus or minus one. I'll just, I'll call it one, but it depends on orientations. So is there like a global number? Oh, something that says like these three components are linked together somehow? Yeah, yeah that's a kind of higher order linking number that we'll talk about shortly. Yeah, um, so there was a way to generalize it to think about how is the system of three links, how are they linked together? And um, we'll talk about that when we talk about Milner's mu bar invariance. Yeah, maybe we'll preview that in a second, actually. Okay, so if a link, when you do link homotopy, linking number stays the same. And that's true for, for all, you know, for all, you know, I and J. So then what's the natural question? If you know link homotopy implies linking numbers are the same, what might you ask? Ah, oh, great. You might ask if the converse is true. If two links are link homotopic, does that mean if two links have the same linking number, does that mean they're link homotopic? So let's begin thinking about two component links. If I just have a link with two components, So suppose I have two two-component links, and they have the same linking number. Can you argue that the link homotopic? How, how might we do that? So say I have some link, you know, L, and say L is some link between L1 and L2, and I have some linking number uh, linking number between L1 and L2. Then if I had some other link, you know, L prime, so that was a uh, two common link between L1 prime and L2 prime, and it had the same linking number, would these two links be link homotopic? The answer is yes. yes. So let's see why. Let's see why. If I have some, uh, uh, so let's say the linking number here, I'll just call it, I'll just call it, uh, well, I'll just call it like N or something. So I have some link here. What I can do is via link homotopy, I can, I can unknot both components, right? I can unknot my L1 and my L2. And so then what am I left with? Well, I have some L1, I have some, and I've unknotted it, I have some L1, I have some L2, maybe I should use different colors, I have some L2, but they're still going to be linked together somehow. Like, you know, somewhere this link is probably going to come up and link with the orange guy, you know, and somewhere else he's going to come and link up with the orange guy again. And you know maybe it does this several times. Somewhere else, he may come up and link with the orange guy. And maybe somewhere else he comes up and he links with the orange guy in some way. But here's the key idea. By homotoping this white guy and this orange guy, I can move L what I'll call a standard position. Or 
where like you've pulled the white free from the orange except for where they're linked together. You know, it's like you're trying to pull the white free from the orange, you let the white pass through itself and the orange pass through itself, but sometimes they get caught on each other. And so you'll be left with something like this. You're pulling orange, the white's free, but you'll get caught in orange. You'll get caught at orange at some places. You'll get caught with the orange at a few places. And so you get something like this. Now, when you're in the standard position, as you move into the standard position, notice how these guys are linked opposite. Right, like, like this guy, uh, white is on top of the orange, where here, white goes under the orange. But, but what do you notice about these two guys? What do you notice about those? Yeah, that's exactly right, Matthew. You can, take the, you can take this orange component and you can pull it behind the white, right? So since they're linked in opposite directions, they end up canceling. So you have some canceling that happens, leaving you with just some white component and some orange component that are then linked some number of times all in the same direction. So it's just linked some some number of times, all in the same direction. And how many times do you think these guys will be linked together? Yeah, whatever the linking number is. These will be linked n times. Linked n times. So you should kind of think through it yourself why, why you can do this. This is a really rough sketch of the argument. But, um, you can move any two component link with linking number n via homotopy into the standard position. Where this is just your, uh, uh, if you think about it, this is really just you know, your orange guy with white going around and linking around it twice. So this is like a, a um, canonical uh, copy of a link that has linking number two. Okay, so this seems quite nice. So if you have two component links, then, you know, it's uh, linking number uh, classifies link homotopy. But what if you have more? What if you have three components? Does the same story hold? Is it still the case that if you have two three component links, and all the pairwise linking numbers are the same, can you homotope one into the other? Can you think of any counterexamples? Someone already said it. I forgot who. The yeah, the bromine rings. So here's my trivial link. If you look at the linking number between any two of them, then these guys have um, pairwise linking number zero between any two components. But if I look at the Borromean rings, uh, oh, dang it. There we go. Got to practice drawing these things for the final. Okay. If you look at this guy, it also has the linking between any two components is zero. So for both of these guys, you know, the linking between L1 and L2 is the same as the linking between L1 and L3, which is the same as the linking between L1 and L, uh, L2 and L3, which in all three cases is zero. Like blue and orange are not linked because blue is always on top of orange. White and blue are not linked because blue is always on top of uh, blue is always under white. But you should try and convince yourself that these are not homotopic. So for three component links, linking number does not classify um, link homotopy doesn't classify links up to link homotopy. Because these are same link pairwise linking numbers, but they have, um, they're, they're not link homotopic. 
Now, it's really hard in general to see that these are not link homotopic, right? Like, like, I don't know if I can give you a little, like, you need to develop some kind of invariant of link homotopy and convince yourself then that the invariant takes different values for these. But maybe it helps a little bit if I redraw the Bermuda rings. Um, slightly different, I'm going to redraw them like this. You can begin by convincing yourself the Bramian rings can also be depicted like this. So, so like, what did I, what did I do? I, I essentially like pulled this orange and, and trapped it over the the white, you know. And so I still have like. If the orange was free, the white and blue would be separate. If the blue was gone, the white and orange would separate, etc. It's still the Bromian rings, but maybe it's a little bit easier now to see, like, well, it's more believable at least that the, there's no way to move from here to the trivial link just by letting components pass through themselves. That they're really trying to pass through each other in a way that they're not allowed to. How does removing orange, blue, and white? Oh, good. If 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 orange was free then this white on the inside could come out through the blue. If there was no orange here, yes, 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 yep, yes, then this part could yes. come out. Got it. Yeah, yeah, it takes some, takes some convincing. Okay, so, so link homotopy preserves linking number, but linking number isn't enough, is, isn't enough information to classify link homotopy. You need some more additional information. It turns out that for three component links, you need this higher order linking number that tells you some information about how the three components are linked. And for four component links, you need even more information. And so in general, it's kind of a tough thing to, to say, you know, what, uh, how do I understand what two things are linked from a topic? You can't just look at linking number if there's more than two components. You need higher order invariants as well. Yeah. So the question I want us to end with today is, well, is there some kind of local move that both preserves linking number and is classified by linking number? So if these two, if two links have the same linking numbers, pairwise linking numbers, then you can move from one to the other just by doing this local move. Does the question make sense? Uh, you know, here, here, it didn't, here it didn't work. I tried to do this link homotopy, it's a local move, but it preserved the linking number, but it's, if two number, links have the same pairwise linking number, it didn't necessarily mean that they are the same, uh, that they are linked homotopic to each other. So I want to introduce you to a third and final uh, local move. So this is our third local move. And this is going to be called a delta move. And we're beginning to get to the place where I need my notes to draw good pictures. Oh, I didn't say that. That's okay. We'll save that for another time. So what a delta move does is it begins with some delta formation like this. Let me draw this better. It's like you're drawing the trefoil to begin with, but then you complete it like this. It begins with something like this, and then it moves it via a delta move into, um, so I still want to have these six points on the outside because the rest of my link's going to stay the same. It's just I'm changing what happens here locally. And so this arc right here, instead of being an under arc, is going to become an, an over arc. And so what I mean by that is this arc is going to become an arc going over like this. And uh, this arc right here is going to now bend in the opposite direction. So he's now going to bend in the opposite direction. And this arc is also going to bend in the opposite direction. So you just have everything bend in the opposite direction. But you still have six points. And it's called a delta move because it's like you're taking this triangle and flipping it upside down. It's like flipping a delta. But let me try and begin by giving you some preliminary evidence that this is probably the kind of thing we want. 
See, last time our problem was the Brimian rings could not be moved into the trivial link. But what happens if you take the Brimian rings, and maybe this is a trajectory that looks kind of like the Brimian rings, what happens if you take the Brimian rings, uh, I'm gonna take these Brimian rings, and I'm going to apply a delta move to them. And so I think the best way for me to do this is to draw the Brimian rings again. Is, is the delta move anything other than a rotation? It looks like a rotation. Well, so remember, it's leaving the rest of the link fixed. Mm -hmm. So like this is happening like within some circle. And like within some sphere, and everything else out here is staying fixed. And so, you know, like, like this point that was this point before is now this point. And this point that was this point is now this point. So previously, this arc connected this point and this point, and it still connects them, but it bends the opposite way, right? And this arc connected this point and this point. It still connects them, but it bends the opposite way. And this arc connected this point and this point, and it still connects them, but it bends the opposite way. And then the rest of the link outside looks exactly the same. So I'm going to try and draw that right now. So to do so, I'm just going to draw another copy of the, uh, of the uh, Bohemian rings. So exactly how I had it before. But now I'm going to take some sphere, take that delta, and now I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the inside. Right? So I'm going to move it from this picture, which is inside it right now, to this picture inside it. So, so I need to redraw the inside, applying my delta move to it. And so now in the new picture, uh, you're going to have this guy on top is going to come bend down like this. And this one's going to go over him, over him, and then under and connect with this guy. And this one is going to go over him and under like that. And notice what this new diagram is. It kind of looks like three Pac-Mans are all trying to eat each other, you know? But, but just pull the Pac-Man back a little bit, you know, back up Pac-Man, and, and you just back them up a little bit, and this is equivalent, you can see like, this piece just backs up a little bit, and this piece just goes up a little bit, and this piece just goes back a little bit, and it's just a trivial link. So here, uh, Borimian rings, is delta equivalent, there was a delta move, or a series of delta moves, here just one, to move the Brimian rings into the trivial link. And what our theorem tells us is that two links, so uh, some link L, which is like some L1 L2 through LM, some M component link, is delta equivalent, is related by a series of delta moves. So I'll call that delta equivalent. To some other link, L prime, so which is some L1 prime, L2 prime through LM prime. If and only if the linking number between your pairwise linking number, L1, uh, let's say Lji with Lj, is always equal to the linking number between Li prime and Lj prime for all i and j 
between 1 and M. Yeah. So you can move from one link to another link via these delta moves if and only if your linking number everywhere is the same. If you, only if your pairwise linking number is the same. Do you want to see another example of it? I was going to prove this, but, but maybe what I'll do is I'll link to the paper that proves this in detail. And let me just end by showing one more example of this uh, in action. So let me do it right here. I mean, this, you shouldn't believe this. Like, this, this is unbelievable. And, and, like, the reason you shouldn't believe it is because, like, like look. This link, this whitehead link, has linking number zero. So does the trivial link. What that tells me is that there's some series of delta moves from here to here. Well, delta moves and ambient isotopy. You know, you can still isotope the, the link like usual. But that means we can move from the whitehead link to the trivial link using just delta moves and ambient isotopy. You know that you, you deform the pieces, but you don't let them move through themselves. Where's the delta? You know, there's like, there's no delta in this thing. So like, how is that possible? Yeah, you have to like ambient isotope it somehow, and then you know, then the claim is that there will be a delta move. Well, well, let me show you how this is done, and and maybe um, it will be so convincing that you'll begin to be open to the possibility that um, it is possible to to um, to do this in in more interesting cases. So I'm just going to simplify things a little bit. I'm going to draw the picture like this. I have some, you know, I have something like this going on, where that's just this linking. I don't want to draw the rest. And then this part's crossing over it, right? And it's like, I'd be really happy if I could get that orange guy to cross under it instead of over it. Because if the or this orange line crossed under it, then that orange piece would be free, and I could untwist that piece, and I'll have the trivial. So I need to show how to move from this diagram, isotoping things around and using a delta move maybe, to get to the orange guy being under the diagram. So let's do it. So the way I'm going to isotope this to begin with, so I'm going to, I'm going to do a, going to, going to isotope this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to slide this orange one. And so you watch me to make sure I'm not doing anything sketch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this orange piece and I'm just going to lift it up a little bit, lift it up a little bit, and move it like this. So, so what did I do? I lifted it up behind this front clasp, but it's not trapped between the two clasp. So take a second and convince yourself that's legal. And you're like, well, why would I do that? Because now I have a little delta here. I get, I get a little delta there. Oh, actually, I have two little deltas. I, I have another little delta right there. <laughs> I got delta's glomora. So I can, I can now perform a delta move. And so now performing a delta move. So this, this, just to remind us, this was white, this was white, this was white, and this is my orange piece. I can perform a delta move, which is going to be flipping one of those upside down, and it ends up looking like, okay, let me see if I can, can draw this correctly. It ends up looking 
like this. After performing a delta move, I get something like this. So when I do this delta move, he moves into this position, which you can then see is the same thing as the orange just being behind the clasp. And so by cleverly isotoping it and then doing a delta move, I was able to move the orange from in front to behind the clasp. So up here, what that means is, by some combination of isotopy and a delta move, I can move this to where the orange is just behind the white. And then that's the same as, well, the white you can see on twist and the orange is already unknotted. So what maybe I'll do in the problem set that I'll attach in the video description is I'll put a couple um, moves like this, going from something to something else, and your job would be to try and work out the details of how you can do that via a clever delta move. Yeah, okay. So for, for each of these, we could draw the diagram of just those six points. And maybe it becomes a little bit clearer. You know, it's like, okay, you have just these six points. Uh, well, okay, I'm using different colors down here than I did over there, which is kind of confusing, but. And six points. And so here, what do you have? You have this orange is bending under like that. And he's been going over like this. And this blue one's going like that, right? And now what happens over here is now instead, this orange, I hope this works, is bending the opposite way. Um, these whites, white passes over orange and under this other one. And connecting the blue is a strand that goes under the orange and over the other one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little bit tough to see it. <laughs> but I think when you, when you trace out the details, you see it really is a delta move. It really is a delta move from one the one to the other. So I think it's quite amazing that these delta moves let you move from you know, any two links that have the same kind of linking information will be related by a series of delta moves. Like it's, really, it's really not obvious. You can you know, come up with all kinds of complicated links that, uh, you know, like for instance, we, we could just, I don't know, we can make up some crazy complicated link and they would be related just by delta moves. So I'll link to the, um, in the description a, uh, a paper that goes through this proof in detail. It's a, very, it's a geometric proof that develops a series of moves like these and then uses those moves to show that you can move anything into some standard position and therefore they're equivalent if they have the same link information. Okay, let's stop there for today. <laughs>